Well, um, good morning. It's now 10 o'clock, so we will um, start the meeting. Um, welcome to the Place Scrutiny Committee meeting of Thursday, the 23rd of July. A couple of general points for us for members, really. Um, we've been involved in these meetings for some time now, so um, we, we know we need to turn the um, video feeds off and the mute for microphones, which I think everybody has done now. Please use RTS in the chat box if you wish to speak. And make, I'll make a record of, of those and we will come back to those after the officer reports. Um, when you do wish to speak, if you reference the page you're referring to, to allow the officers um, time to actually go to that page before you start speaking, that'd be great. Um, if, it, if we require a vote, I will call out your names and um, if you could please respond in turn, that would be excellent. Thank you. Um, item one on the agenda is apologies. Um, have we got any apologies? Yes, Chairman, apologies from Councillor Robin Cook. Thank you. Um, item two is minutes. Um, can I have your permission to sign these as a true and accurate record? Yes. I hear, I hear no dissent, so we will take that as um, given. Thank you. Item three is the declarations of interest. Can we confirm um, <clears throat> that you have no declaration of interest under the Code of Conduct? Again, I hear no responses, so we'll take that as, as uh, given. Thank you. Item four is public participation. If you could please note, we have 30 minutes allocated for these questions, um, and therefore the preambles and statements not requiring answers will not be read out. Questions and answers to these questions will, however, and um, all committee members um, have received all of the information prior to this meeting and the statements and questions are online. Lindsay, you're going to start the first questions. Um, the first question is from Sarah Daniels. OK, um, question one. I welcome the draft strategy and the Council's commitments to carbon emissions reductions. Will there now be a re-evaluation of the residual waste treatment options identified within the Joint Municipal Waste Management Strategy for Dorset 2008-33 to ensure that Dorset Council is not committing to activities and operations in Dorset that would lead to an increase in carbon emissions? Chairman, would you like me to read um, Sarah Daniels' second question or do the response? To I think the we do I think we we'll take them one at a time, uh, Lindsay. Um, okay. If we just mention all the answers will be read out by Karen Punchard, who is our Corporate Director for the Place Services. Karen. Thank you, Chairman. Um, the Bournemouth Christchurch um, and Poole Dorset Waste Plan was adopted by Dorset Council <clears> in 2019. <throat> the preparation of this plan included an assessment of the need for new waste management facilities to address waste arisings over the next 15 years. The plan estimated a significant shortfall in capacity for managing non-hazardous residual waste. The plan has identified four sites for new or expanded facilities for the management of this waste. The site allocations are flexible and will allow for a, way, a range of waste recovery technologies. This will allow for technology advances in the waste industry new legislation and regulation. The Joint Municipal Waste Management Strategy for Dorset was updated in 2017 and will be updated again in 2022, every five years. Or before then, if there are significant changes to the industry, for example, the government's Waste and Resources Strategy for England that was published in 2019 could prompt a review of the strategy ahead of 2022. Policy Objective 4 of this strategy is ensuring that residual waste treatment takes into account the waste hierarchy and cost in maximising the value recovered from waste in terms of resources and energy. Thank you, Karen. Um, question two from Sarah Daniels, please, Lindsay. <clears throat> OK, question two is how will Dorset Council apply the commitment to carbon emissions reductions in all new planning permission applications, particularly where proposed developments could lead to an increase in local carbon emissions levels? Thank you, Karen. 
The Climate Change Executive Advisory Panel are meeting with representatives of the Local Plan Executive Advisory Panel to discuss the impacts of the emerging local plan on carbon emissions and the ways in which the Council's commitment to carbon reduction can be implemented through the local plan and planning policy in August. Thank you. Um, our first question from Philip Jordan. OK, the question is, how and in what ways are you engaging slash progressing towards sustainable success and for that matter, equally sustainable exit? And the answer, as included in the next steps section of the climate and ecological strategy, work is now taking place on a costed detailed action plan which will map out Dorset Council's journey to being carbon neutral by 2040. Thank you. And the second one, Lindsay. Um, the second question is, where's the call for ideas suggested switch of DC slash other Dorset consumers to RE at seemingly little extra cost, i.e. enable at least some cross-sector emissions reductions without the reported significant investment at all levels of society, whilst work can be done at some extra cost on bringing to fruition imperial colleges, gifts, calls for ideas submission, harmonised with, for example, deep green building retrofit slash transport and Navitus wind farm with WMP as its thus revitalised base. And Karen. And the answer, Dorset Council have secured a certified renewable energy provision from the 1st of October for 12 months, subject to extension if requested. And this will be for all corporate sites and some schools subject to request. Thank you. Thank you. Right, question from Tony Waters, please. <clears throat> What actions will the Place Scrutiny Committee be expecting in order for the autumn consultation to be meaningful and for as many stakeholders in Dorset as possible to participate? What abbreviated or summary formats are proposed for communicating the strategy? And carrying it again. <laughs> the public consultation will be carefully designed to allow qualitative and quantitative data to be easily collected and analysed. The consultation will, will be web based, but every effort will be made to ensure that the exercise is fully inclusive with opportunities to engage with as diverse an audience as possible. The climate change strategy forms the public facing document and is a summary of the full technical analysis and these can be found in the accompanying technical papers which can be accessed using the links in the strategy. There are numerous images, diagrams and video links, along with a glossary and index to make reading the document as easy as possible, but which unenviably adds to the length of the overall document. The consultative questions will be clearly linked to the relevant sections of the strategy to make answering the questions as easy as possible. Thank you. Um, next, we have a question from Kaz Dennett on behalf of Extinction Rebellion. OK, given that this strategy is fundamental and will be embedded in all aspects of the corporate plan, what measures do the scrutiny committee believe need to be put in place to ensure staff receive adequate initial and ongoing climate and ecological emergency training to help them deliver the strategy and forthcoming action plan? The climate and ecological emergency strategy has been developed with staff who've been engaged in the baseline data gathering exercise. The strategy will be presented to staff using a variety of well established staff engagement tools and will be included in induction training. It will form part of a Dorset Council leadership forum, senior manager workshops, and will be the subject of topic specific all staff briefings. The results of the annual monitoring and review against the action plan 
will also be communicated to members, staff and the public. Thank you. Right, our second question from Extinction Rebellion um, through Julie Ann Booker. Thank you. Given that the draft and coming action plan will have to be flexible enough to keep abreast of moving scientific information, would scrutiny committee be more assured that the strategy could be achieved if monitoring and updating plans slash targets in the strategy was spelt out now in a clearer, transparent and more robust manner? Karen. <laughs> Progress against the action plan will be reviewed quarterly internally by officers to ensure that projects remain on track and to identify any areas of concern where actions may have to be amended or enhanced and to allow the flexibility to take into account scientific developments and changes in central government policy. The annual monitoring and review process will be measured against the commitments in the action plan, the results of which will be made public in a clear, robust and transparent manner. Thank you. Um, next question is from Debbie Tulip. In view of the fact that the 2020 EU taxonomy excludes waste incineration, incineration sorry, from their list of green or sustainable activities, can the council confirm that they will support this stance and oppose the proposed Portland energy from waste incinerator? And yours, Karen, thank you. The Bournemouth Christchurch Pool and Dorset Waste Plan was adopted by Dorset Council in December 2019. The preparation of this plan included an assessment of the need for new waste management facilities to address waste arisings over the next 15 years. The plan estimated a significant shortfall in capacity for managing non-hazardous residual waste. The plan identifies four sites for new or expanded facilities for the management of this waste. The proposal mentioned does not lie within an allocated site and once an application is submitted will be considered on its merits taking into consideration national policy and the waste plan policies, including the spatial strategy and guiding principles of the plan, which cover the waste hierarchy and managing waste in line with the proximity principle. As a result of Dorset declaring a climate and ecological change emergency, the applicant has been advised that any application should be accompanied by an assessment of how the proposal will help to reduce the carbon footprint in terms of the management of waste in appropriate facilities and locations. Proposals will also be expected to demonstrate that the site design, layout and operation will make provision for climate change mitigation and resilience. Consideration should also be given to utilising landscape design to offset carbon emissions. Thank you. And our second question from Debbie Tullett. Does the council agree that the Portland waste incinerator proposal is an environmentally unfriendly proposal which vitiates the county's strategy on the climate and ecological emergency? And Karen. The Bournemouth Christchurch Pool and Dorset Waste Plan has identified a need for additional capacity for managing residual waste, even taking into account the high recycling rates that Dorset Council Waste Services have managed to achieve. Applications for waste treatment facilities will be considered against the policies of the Waste Plan. Policy 6, which covers recovery facilities, ensures that proposals do not displace the management of waste which is already managed or likely to be managed by a process which is further up the waste hierarchy than being proposed, unless the proposal would result in benefits sufficient to outweigh that displacement. Thank you. Um, next question is from Dave Warren. Could the advisory panel confirm that they have specifically researched and documented 
the environmental and ecological effects of EFW incineration. Thank you, Karen. Thank you. That's energy from waste incineration. Um, as part of any future waste treatment solution, a range of technologies and different solutions would be explored, taking into account environmental and ecological impact assessments, so not just energy from waste technology. Thank you. And our second question from Dave Warren. If the advisory panel disagrees with the EU Technical Experts Group's decision to exclude EFW from its green list and classify EFW as an obstacle to the circular economy, please could they explain how they justify their position? The Joint Municipal Waste Strategy for Dorset was adopted in 2008 and revised in 2017. This was prior to the green list being developed and prior to the council declaring a climate and ecological change emergency. The joint municipal waste strategy for Dorset sets out the strategic direction for Dorset waste up to 2033. However, it has already been updated and is due to be updated every five years or if there is a, any significant change. A significant change in the waste industry is the government's Waste and Resources Strategy for England 2019. Therefore, any updated strategy, which is due in 2022, will take into account all of these local, national and international changes. Thank you. Um, Thank that, you. that concludes the um, that questions. I seem to have some feedback on this microphone, which is odd. Um, yeah, um, thank all the um, questioners um, for their participation and thank you for the questions. Thank you, Lindsay and Karen, for uh, reading those questions out and answering those. We have statements also for Bernard White, Richard Bedding and Rob Smith. As I said before, they're all online. Um, they're available to the public and all members have had copies of those uh, prior to the discussion later in the agenda. Um, I will mention that some of the questions were actually directed at the Place Scrutiny Committee. I just wanted to highlight uh, that the committee will discuss the papers later in the meeting and therefore have not formulated the position at this stage. Um, I also need to inform that this is the last meeting of the current uh, committee and I cannot answer the new chairman and committee moving forward. I think at this time it's probably appropriate to thank the committee for all their work over the last year and in particular our Democratic Services Officer Lindsay Watson. Um, thank you for everything you've done. Right, item five on the agenda are urgent items and we have none. Item six is the climate uh, an ecological emergency strategy for public consultation. Um, I've got a few words to actually utter before that starts. Um, this report comes to scrutiny prior to Cabinet on the 30th of July, and we have been asked, we've been asked if the strategy is fit for consultation. At this point, I'd like to inform you that I've been a member of the Climate and Ecological Emergency Executive Advisory Panel since it was formed, um, following two petitions on climate change presented to full council on the 18th of July 2019. Both mine and Councillor Clayton's petitions were very similar to each other and apart from the date that Dorset Council has become carbon neutral, much the same. It's now a full year since that petition. We have a strategy document in front of us today backed up by eight technical documents which are extremely good. However, the costed plan and ownership elements of that plan are still not ready, which is deeply disappointing. The final plan being ready for Cabinet early next year is difficult to accept. I believe a costed delivery plan will never be accurate from the day it is printed and therefore would request pace rather than precision. With so many unknowns along the path, we, like many others, uh, require the government to step up and support the many initiatives Dorset will require and to ensure the UK is in a place to influence others globally. We need a dedicated lead member and officer to drive this forward. We need a delivery plan as soon as possible, and we need ownership of each element of that plan. 
I think we need exceptional communication both internally exter and externally, which I'm sure we will get. I thought I'd add um, a little positivity as well, because um, we do continue to work towards a carbon neutral council and have done for many years now. Our target of 2040 is just that. It doesn't change because the papers will not be finalised until, until next year. We have great examples of what we've done and continue to do. I've got a list of them, the low carbon endorsement initiative, the waste reductions, um, the funding of litter free uh, coast and sea. There are many, many examples of what we have done and continue to do. I could go on and on. Um, one final thing I think we should mention before I go to the officer's reports and questions from committee is the fact that um, I sometimes have to pinch myself because over the last four months we've managed the pandemic as well. I think we will move on. Right, the report um, introduction is being given by um, Councillor Ray Bryan, who is the portfolio holder for highways, travel and the environment. Ray, over to you. Thank you. Uh, in the days of our declaration, I was to always tell the truth, so I've made sure we do just that. We needed to know all the facts before making proposals. When I was young, I was taught that when you are cutting a piece of wood, you measure twice and cut once. That is something I do throughout my life. I think twice to ensure decisions made will be correct. This is without doubt a major decision taken by the council, which is why we have gone through so many stages as we compiled these reports. Can I at this very early stage place on record my thanks to Matt Reeks, Anthony Littlechild, Wendy Carmichael, who between them have worked so hard to bring this to its current stage. My thanks also to Dr Ken Buchan and Karen Punchard for all their support. The road ahead is not going to be easy. I will now pass over to Karen to present the paper. I will of course be available to answer questions <coughs> that are not technical. The officers will do, deal with that. Over to you Karen. Thank you Ray. <coughs> OK, thank you, Ray. Um, I'm, I'm going to pass very, very swiftly on to um, Matt Reeks and Anthony Littlechild, um, two of the officers who've been um, integral in um, developing the strategy, um, who have got, um, I think, a PowerPoint um, presentation for the um, committee to take you through the, the document. So handing over now to Matt and Anthony. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Karen. Uh, good morning, Chairman. Good morning, Councillors. Um, good morning. Thank you for your time. Uh, Anthony, Anthony and I are between us. Uh, we'll just briefly give you an overview of the strategy paper. Um, you've all had it in its 60 page glory uh, and its 210 page accompanying uh, technical documents. So we won't, uh, we won't do it page by page because we might be here for the rest of the week, uh, but significant to say we'd like to point out a few uh, few highlights. Chair, so in terms chair, chair, sorry. It, it, sorry, sorry, Lindsay, it's, it's Kate Critchell. Um, Matt, can you please um, share your desktop, please, um, so I can put the presentation up? So you should be able to see it now, Kate. Is there no? <clears throat> yeah, it's just not live, Chairman. Just uh, hold on one moment. Should be coming through now. Sorry, you can continue. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry about that. So our, our road to the completion of the strategy was, uh, as Councillor Brian said, influenced by the determination to get it right uh, and deliver a, a strategy that was well researched, uh, technically correct and, and ultimately de deliverable. Um, as you can imagine, this is a this is a huge subject um, and did require uh, some significant sort of background research. 
before you, you'll see just a, a few of the steps that we, we undertook in the, the lead up to the production, primarily around the recruitment um, and appointment of a corporate sustainability team, um, of which Anthony is the manager. Uh, staff workshops leading to the creation of task and finish groups. This was involving all areas of Dorset Council service, uh, not only to uh, gather their particular expertise in their service area, but also to create that early engagement and, and buy-in from the staff. Engaged with our town and parish council partners through a series of workshops, at which point we were also able to offer them a briefing about the support available through the Low Carbon Dorset programme. We sought views from Dorset residents via an online call for ideas, and especially from young people through the direct representation to the EAP in December. And again, this was really important, not only to gather together ideas, which a lot of well-informed residents had, but also to engage with them and make very public the work that we were doing. The call for ideas led to some inquiry days in February and March, uh, and this was where particular individuals, community groups, children and youth parliament were invited to directly present their ideas to the EAP. As you'll see from the strategy document, these ideas have all been included where possible within the strategy. We also worked across a variety of particular topic specific networks that we're involved in, uh, looking at how other local authorities, central government and interested third parties are tackling climate change. Alongside this piece of work was the collation analysis of the baseline data for Dorset Council, wider Dorset's carbon footprint. And just worth noting at this point, members, due to the circumstances around uh, local government reorganisation, this is a particularly challenging piece of work. Obviously, to head towards our carbon neutral target, we need to know exactly where we are now, bringing together uh, data from the predecessor authorities that was often collated and recorded in a different way has proved quite a challenge. The team are more than up to it and that work is now progressing. Anthony, can I hand over to you? Anthony? Good morning. Good morning. Can you hear me? I can hear you, Anthony. <laughs> OK, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, OK, what I wanted to do is just spend uh, a few minutes picking out a few of the uh, key parts, I think, of the strategy document. So you've all obviously seen the, the full document. Um, I'm just going to highlight a couple of sections. Um, so the first thing I wanted to pick out was uh, the section which is called our approach. Uh, this basically sets out the way we've gone about uh, developing the strategy and how we'll um, be taking uh, the activities in the strategy forward. I think three, one of the key points that's shown on this slide is that we've divided up, uh, we recognise them, divided up action between different types of actions, recognising that the the, um, the council can have a certain role across the whole of Dorset, uh, but has a very uh, key role in terms of its own estate. So we've divided up the um, activities into those where we can take direct action on our own uh, estate to get ourselves to uh, carbon neutral, uh, areas where we have services which have a wider impact across the county, so indirect activities through our services, and areas where we're going to have to work and already are working with uh, wider partners and the community to uh, take action across um, wider Dorset. Uh, also in this area, it highlights the fact that there's a, there's going to be a big role in trying to encourage uh, national government to put in place a whole raft of measures and, and uh, there's, a, there's a key lobbying uh, task for the council. And it also highlights that taking action on the climate and ecological emergency has a number of um, benefits, not just in terms of saving carbon emissions, but much wider benefits in terms of uh, health and well-being, local economy, uh, and whole sort of gambit around sustainability, I suppose, in terms of social, economic and environmental benefits. OK, thank you. Thank you, Anthony. Uh, the, the, sorry, the next slide, please, Matt. The, so the, uh, the, um, the next section I want to draw out was the section on carbon budgets. So within this section, we have uh, done an analysis of 
potential carbon emissions across the county and within the council and looked at what sort of trajectories we might want to have in terms of reducing our carbon emissions and settled uh, on a, a carbon trajectory to reach zero by 2050 for the count, county uh, and a target to try and do that sooner by getting to carbon neutrality by 2040 for um, the uh, council itself. And what the section also does is breaks it down into a number of sort of small smaller chunks into carbon budgets if you like set some sort of steps so within uh, this section you can see there's some broad uh, targets around 2025 2030 2035 etc uh, and these will be obviously worked up with more details we start doing the action planning so that we'll have some more specific probably annual targets that we can aim towards thank you next slide please Um, the, the key body of the report has been broken down into sort of eight sec sections, eight action sections. Uh, this is just uh, one example. Each section uh, sets the sort of broad direction of travel, tries to um, give a summary effectively of uh, what the key challenges are, the topic area. So this one on renewable energy. Um, and then if we move on to the next slide, oh, uh, it, sorry, each section also contains um, video links and uh, link to the more detailed background papers so it becomes more of a sort of multimedia uh, affair uh, and each section has a section in terms of um, uh, key actions that we're that we're looking to take forward that will be developed in more detail um, and these again are split into those that we can take directly those we can take through our services and those that we will need to take in partnership working with others uh, and a link to, to the more uh, detailed background papers that have been uh, mentioned earlier. Thank you. Next section. Just wanted to highlight. So I think this is one of the key parts of the strategy, which is called making it happen. And this is really about how do we sort of embed the, the activities within uh, the foundations or the heart of the what the council does. Um, and obviously we've identified that already at the heart of our corporate plan. So there's a whole raft of actions in here which identify how do we actually sort of mainstream um, the whole issue, how do we make sure that all our strategies and policies are all aligned um, and that we were all doing things to support the, um, the pathway towards carbon neutrality rather than um, sort of opposing it. This picked out four different areas. There's the leadership and governance, making sure we have structures in place, staff in place, etc. There's a, um, a note around funding and a need to make sure that we've identified uh, funding and also work out how we can pull in external funding. Hopefully some will come from government. Uh, and it picks out uh, the importance of engagement and communication both internally with our own staff and also wider across the whole of the county. So this is a, a county wide approach is obviously much wider than just what the council can do. It's much more about what everyone in uh, across Dorset can do, individuals, organisations, and we all need to sort of work together. Uh, and lastly, picks out uh, the importance things we mentioned before around monitoring and reporting and the fact that there will be uh, some regular windows of reporting firstly against some of the key performances around some of some of those uh, carbon reduction targets so we'll be able to report on those probably annually um, and we'll also be able to report much more uh, frequently in terms of our own actions or particular key uh, things that we're doing. Uh, I think that's all I wanted to say I'll pass over back to uh, Matt to finish off. Thank you. Thank you Anthony uh, and Finally, uh, Chairman Members, um, around the particular next steps uh, is obviously the detailed uh, action planning uh, of the work. So this will be based broadly across the eight key themes which are identified in the strategy. Each area of action, as we've already discussed, uh, direct, indirect and influencing, will be broke, broken down into key measurable actions. These will then be costed uh, and timelined against the key targets that we mentioned earlier on in the carbon budgeting section and also scored against the um, criteria that you can see before you say so their ecological value, the resilience of the measure, the economic impact or value uh, and also the health and well-being benefits to enable us uh, to be able to give a sort of indication of the priority of those actions um, 
against the cost. And also it's important to say the potential savings from some of those uh, in an effort to um, monetize the carbon saving. Uh, obviously those will also be highlighted in terms of any potential revenue savings. That work is taking place as we speak uh, and it's our intention to um, be able to present the detailed costed action plan for approval by the Council in October of this year. Many thanks. Thank you Matt and Anthony, that's um, excellent. Right, um, questions from members. I think because of the subject, well, I'll go through the list of members to actually see if you would like to ask questions rather than use the RTS. So um, first of all, Cherry, have you got anything? Yeah, I, I, I'm muted now. Sorry, it just takes a second um, yeah. and it throws me. OK, um, just to say thank, thank you for the, the report and the presentation. I'm, I'm really quite um, heartened by it that we've managed to move so fast. Um, one, of, one of the things that slightly concerned me, though, is that when I was, I was in a, um, a, a, another meeting last week with some people and the, one particular person who heads up um, a very large part of a, a worldwide bank was saying that we, we have a real trouble with data at the moment because a lot of data is inaccurate. Um, and when people are having to forecast, particularly with COVID, um, that they're erring on the side of um, caution and disaster rather than what's the reality. So I just um, wonder whether, because I know you've mentioned it um, uh, slightly that the, the, uh, the data was not um, always available. Have we got enough data and have we got enough confidence in it um, that we need to implement that strategy? Thank you. And that's Matthew or Anthony. Anthony, Anthony, do you want to uh, take this one? Yeah, sorry, I was just trying to work out how to unmute myself. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank you. Thanks for the question. Um, yes, as you pointed out, so the, the the key information that we that we have been struggling to sort of pull together, I think, is the uh, baseline data in terms of what is our current uh, carbon footprint as an organization and I think that's just because we've come together as 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 a number of authorities into into one uh, and we have just different systems and things in, pl in place in different different places so it's just take it's been a little bit more challenging uh, we've got some work currently underway so the hope is that we will get a much more accurate picture uh, of that data now we've now we've sort of been in existence for a whole uh, year and we're just in the process of pulling that together so that we're hoping by the time we come to the action plan stage we'll have um, a more detailed baseline against which we can uh, measure. Thank you. Okay, Chair, have you got anything else? Hello, Cherry, anything else? Sorry, I said no, thank you, just as the mute came up. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. Thanks, thanks, Siri. Um, moving on then, our next speaker will be Jean Dunseith. Jean, have you got any questions? Uh, thank you, Chairman. Didn't know if you, oh, whoops, sorry. We can hear you. Yeah, yeah, sorry, yeah, I'm here. Um, I think this is a very good uh, strategy. It's It has breadth and it has depth. But one of the questions earlier was about the public consultation. I know we're going to pass this on to um, the, ex the executive you know, cabinet uh, and then we're going to have the public consultation, eight week public consultation. And I I don't think people, a lot of people are going to read the 60 pages. And I just wondered if it would be possible for us to recommend there's um, maybe an executive summary or something like that as an introduction for when the public do take part in the survey. Instead of them having to use the link and refer to the more detailed document. Thank you, Chairman. Yeah, thank you, Jean. Um, then you'd also like to respond to that one. First, I think it sounds a very good idea because, as you say, it's not only the 60 page strategy, but it's the um, the eight technical documents as well, which are excellent, but they do take quite a bit of reading. Yeah. Thank you. Anthony, Matt, anything? Yes, thank, thank you, Chairman. I'm quite happy to pick this one up. I think there 
there is to some extent to make the consultation meaningful a need for the respondent to be aware of the facts in quite substantial detail um, as we know this is a very emotive subject um, and sadly the answers aren't quite as simple as we'd all like them to be i would suggest we would be able to if you like put a series of executive summaries around each groupings of questions so for example uh, as we've said previously in the meeting the, the questioning will be quite closely linked to sections of the strategy so I would suggest as a, a sort of compromise that each subject area of the consultation is accompanied by a short uh, sort of executive summary uh, as councillor suggests if that would be reasonable yeah that'd be more than reasonable Matthew thank you um, I believe councillor Ray Bryan wants to come in on this one Ray Yes, thank you, Chairman. Uh, I think it's important that we mention at this stage that uh, the consultation um, or the, for the consultation to work correctly, we need to get major comms messages out uh, well in advance leading up to the uh, consultation. And uh, can I just say to the committee, I will ensure that that happens. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Ray. Right, our next councillor is Councillor Simon Gibson. Simon, have you got anything? Uh, yeah, very quickly, Chairman, and thank you. It's on the same topic as, as Jean. Uh, the consultation um, is hugely important for the next step of getting this strategy right. It's already clear from the numbers of people that have engaged so far that there's a lot of public interest in this. And I, I'm very satisfied with Matthew Reeks' answer about putting executive summaries throughout the document. It does help break it down. Uh, personally, I find the, the actions, the direct, indirect and influence actions pages very, very helpful in, in breaking it down in the document already. And um, the only thing I would ask is, given that it's due to go out to consultation in the autumn, is could we as a committee see what the consultation would look like before it goes out? Because I think you know, if we get the comms right and we get the consultation framework right, um, I think that could save us a lot of trouble down the line. Yes, good comments, Simon. Um, obviously, we haven't got a uh, meeting, but I think we could do that electronically. That shouldn't be an issue. Um, Anthony, Matt, any comments on that one? Um, th thank you, Chair. I can come in on that one. Um, yes, we can make sure that we um, include scrutiny members in our um, communications plan um, and make sure that they have advance sight um, and an opportunity to contribute to the um, consultation tools and techniques that we're that, that we're going to use. That's excellent. Thank you, Karen. Um, Ryan, Councillor Ryan Hope. Ryan, are you there? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Uh, first of all, just want to thank the EAP and the officers for putting this document together. It's um, very in-depth, broad, um, and aspirational document uh, that we've got before us today. Just some questions over the financial um, element. We said in, in the introduction that this could cost over Dorset Council over a hundred million pounds to implement. Um, working on the fact that we want to get car zero net carbon by 2040, that's 20 years. That's five million pounds extra a year that we're going to have to find to implement this plan. We've got no guarantee that the government will support us in that, although I think that money should come from central government. It's not fun affair that it's totally down to the taxpayers to be double taxed to get this. What plans are there to to raise the funds to do this um, to get this done? And the other thing is, I know we don't have the action plan before us today, but how do we envision implementing this plan? Are we going to go for the low hanging fruit, the quick wins? to make an impact that may be cheaper and do the bigger ones later. It's quite difficult to really understand the direction and how we're going to achieve this without the plan. I think I think Ryan, to be honest, if I could just say things first, we are we are already doing some of this work anyway. Um, for example, when some of our vehicle fleet comes up for renewal replacement, then the obvious thing is to get procurement to look at the climate change initiative 
and the availability of electric vehicles, for example, to replace parts of those fleet. So that would be an ongoing um, cost anyway to the council. So I think um, that that will happen. And there are another uh, another um, number of issues. Staffing is the obvious one. We've seen throughout COVID, 2,000 plus people working from home and worked really well from home, even if half of those remained home workers, the CO2 um, emissions from just that travel to work will be reduced drastically. So there are things we, we can do. Um, Matthew or Anthony, anything to come back on that one? Um, th thank you, Chair. Uh, um, I, I can come back on this one. I'm Karen Punchard, Corporate Director for Clay Services. Um, I think that the action plan will help to answer some of these questions that is still being developed and the intention really is to make sure that the action plan and the financial consequences feed into the council's wider budget making process so you know you're you're absolutely right councillor ryan you know we, we we don't have new money so this will be about looking at the council's um priorities and how we can repurpose some of our existing service budgets to help achieve those objectives and also how we can work with others um, and help to leave it in partnership funding to achieve those objectives. There are projects that are ongoing at the moment um, that can help to deliver the objectives but looking more longer term it will be a challenge you're absolutely right to um, you know, to fund the the level of activity that we need to achieve, um, and you know, we'll need all the councillors' support to um, you know to help us to deliver that. So it's a debate that needs to be had, and I think that the October cabinet and the action plan will be the place to do that. And I think Anthony just wants to come in as well. Thank you, Anthony. Thank you, Karen. I was, I, all I was going to say was, um, uh, yes, in terms of when we start doing the action planning, obviously we'll be able to identify the, the key things we want to do and associated costs. I think Daryl's already mentioned there are, there are certain things which we're already doing and already uh, have in place and already funded and there are various activities which we already do. Uh, and the other key point, I think, is that some of the uh, early measures we can take will uh, enable us to pay pay the money back quite quickly. So some of some of the activities, some of the energy saving um, actions, will have a very quick, uh, you know, a few year payback. So so there'll be a sort of invest to save element, which we'll also be able to factor in. Thank you, Anthony. Um, I've got Ray next. who wants to comment on this one, and then Brian to come back on the uh, on his question. So Ray. Yes, thank you, Chairman. Uh, in answer to Ryan's question about the low-hanging fruit, uh, he's absolutely right. We're obviously going to be picking that as quickly as we possibly can. And we already highlighted earlier on the fact that we've, uh, in the, we've just signed an agreement for a green electricity supply, which obviously uh, uh, will help. We've, I've just signed off a document that will mean we'll be installing electrical car parking, uh, electrical charging points across our car parks Again, that is at zero cost to ourselves. We've we've sent it out to a contractor and we get a percentage of their uh, profits as part of the deal. And obviously we've got a lot of work still going on in low carbon Dorset. And uh, I probably get two to three applications hit my desk every week for people looking to help us uh, reduce the carbon footprint uh, by installing different things in their facilities. And I, and I really do welcome uh, that sort of input. Thank you, Chairman. That's excellent, Ray. That's a really a win-win. It really is. And of course, I'm sure you'll be lobbying government at the same time. Um, Ryan, you wanted to respond? You can be sure of that, Chairman. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Ray. <laughs> Ryan. No, no, Daryl, actually, uh, sorry, Chair, you just actually hit me right on the point there about we, we must lobby government for funding also. It's yeah. good to see that some of this funding can be met from existing budgets and investor save programmes but we do need the support of, of government to develop this plan. This is such an important plan to the council. As much as we'll be scrutinising it, or the new set of scrutinies will be scrutinising it, the public will be scrutinising us. Extension Rebellion will be scrutinising us. We cannot afford to fail. We need to make sure this is a good plan and we can deliver it. 
Absolutely well said, Ryan. Yeah, that, that's definitely the case. Thank you. Um, Val Pothergree, Councillor Val Pothergree, you're next. Thank you, Please. Chairman. Um, I have no questions today, actually, uh, just comments. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you'd like my comments. Yes, uh, please. Um, well, I think fortunately our carbon emissions are already low in comparison to other counties in the southwest and England as a whole. I think the actions taken by the council listed on page 23 of the draft strategy clearly show that we're taking this issue very seriously. And I agree that the eight key themes identified are the most important. I also agree that the executive uh, summarize, summaries is a good idea. I'd like to congratulate Councillor Bryan and his team, along with the EAP, for, for producing this excellent document against a background of a, of a different world emergency. And I give my best wishes for a successful and inclusive public consultation. Thank you, Chairman. That's excellent, Val. Thank you very much. Um, Councillor Andrew Starr. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'd just like to welcome this report, and it's, it's a very good report, uh, and it does a fantastic job of pointing out the complexities of this situation ahead. However, it's clear that the answers to these questions are somewhat more difficult to pin down. That is largely because of it, they are not in our hands. The report often cites things such as a lack of direction of national direction strategy, inherited infrastructure, business rate levy acting as a significant barrier to, barrier to investment, lack of strategy, lack of legal requirements to fit retro, retrofit businesses, um, all pointing to the government, give us tools that we require to move things forward in many areas. However, it is still of the utmost importance that this council leads the way, endorse it, not only in the way we this this organisation work, works, but also in the, giving a, a, a lead to the county as a whole. Um, and more than one or two specific items I could like to point out on the report, if I may. Um, on page seven, um, to quote, by addressing one of these um, emergencies, we are also addressing the other, being, being the uh, climate and the ecological emergencies. That's not, I wouldn't necessarily agree with that. There's sometimes for instance, uh, from a, a, a climate perspective, electric cars are a good idea. But on the, on um, uh, when it comes to uh, the species that that may be damaged when when the the, uh, uh, the batteries are made from uh, some unsustainable sources. But uh, <coughs> um, also the um, on page eleven, it's a quote human. Sources of emissions are partly responsible. I think we've moved beyond that personally. I think we've, it's not entirely responsible, but we, we, I think the the situation is being accelerated hugely by human um, uh, emissions. Um, and we also, we should, uh, the, the little um, uh, reference to the, uh, the political situation that will be made, will be quite apparent when more and more people from the third world cannot live where they're living now and we will face a, a, a tsunami of people trying to come here which is hugely bad for them obviously but it's but you know the how uh, high the topic is up the agenda at the moment there's nothing to what this will happen and i think that's this will bring and that's i think that's something that the, the public really need to take on board that it's not just a case of saving a few creatures and making making it you know helping it to rain somewhere it's a case that this is going to impact us it's, it's just just as the um covid19 it was seemed far away for a long time and then when it hit us it hit us hard this is going to be the same but much much worse thank you chairman thank you andrew um are there any comments from officers No, I hear none. <laughs> no, I think I think you're you're quite right in the fact that obviously if, if some continents become uninhabitable, there will be a migration um, and that will cause its own impacts as well. Thank you, Andrew. Um, our next speaker is Roland, Councillor Roland Tyre. 
Uh, good morning. I would like to compliment the, the team who produced this report. I think it's an excellent report, an excellent po direction for policies, all the staff that helped them. But uh, Matthew and Anthony have done an excellent presentation today and I'd like to thank them for that. I agree with what, have, what a lot of what has been said, the, the positive things that have been said about all this. My, my comment, it's not a question, is that my experience so far with the new council is that when it comes to the actual planning permissions being given under, we have excellent policies. We have A and B policies, we have environmental policies, we have a minerals plan. When it actually comes to the planning application, when something is totally counter to those policies, instead of just refusing it and taking the consequences and fighting it if it goes to appeal, we seem to be asking for environmental impact assessments and it drags on and on, the thing goes on for about 12 months or longer. Very inconclusive. We should be implementing these um, these new plans and I, I do hope that this one gets implemented un unlike many of the policies which we currently have. Thank you very much. Thank you, Roland. Um, I know we've got uh, Councillor David Walsh, who's the portfolio holder for planning here somewhere in the ether. Um, David, would you like to make a comment on that? It's putting you on the spot a bit, I know. But. <laughs> Thank you, Chairman. It's been very interesting listening to what everyone's got to say. And as was said, um, the Planning EAP Committee is meeting with the Climate Change Committee in August. There are many things that we are going to be implementing through the next local plan, but that will not be adopted before spring 2023. Now, the problem we have in trying to enforce policies that we do not have in place and have not been agreed by the Secretary of State is that we really cannot. We have no way of enforcing things that are not in our policy, which is why I'm saying, and I know Ray is lobbying government, we need some of these climate changes on planning to come through national policy because they can implement it immediately. Ours is going to be three <coughs> years away. And yes, we can just say, no, we refuse this. And then it does go to appeal and then we do lose it. And then we do get costs awarded against us and the development goes ahead anyway. There are things that we are fighting and we are pushing for these new changes in our local plan, but at present implementing them without government support doesn't appear possible. So thank Thanks. you, Chairman. Yeah, thank you, David. Um, Ray didn't want to come back to us now, so we have um, Councillor David Taylor. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for coming on board. Um, fantastic report, excellent uh, outside looking in for a change, which is really good, good observation. My only concern is the fact is that uh, included in the report. I would love to have seen something to do with uh, uh, fly tipping, pollution, you know, dumping our waste on our county because we're working as hard as we can to keep the county clean and uh, carbon free. But there seems to be various people going around and just polluting our lovely county. Have we got anything put into this report where we can actually attack that problem? I think that problem's been tackled through the Waste Partnership, David Bellard. Um, I'm sure Karen will respond. Thank you. Um, yes, you know, we, we do have an enforcement team um, in waste services that deal with um, fly tipping. We also have teams in environmental protection that deal with um, incidents of pollution and work very closely with the Environment Agency to deal with more major um, pollution um, incidents. So yes, you know, there are plans both within the council um, and with our partners to deal with both fly tipping um, and pollution incidents, some of which you're, you're, you're very right, you're very correct, you know, will have a damaging impact um, on, on the environment. So yes, you know, we, we, we just need to make sure that we keep, um, you know, keep vigilant um, and keep monitoring and dealing with those um, as and when we can, particularly those that are harmful to the environment. Thank please, you. Thank you, Sarah. We had a prosecution the other day, which was actually fantastic about a fly tipper of building waste and stuff, which is marvellous. But the only concern that worries, worries me is that it's our taxpayers that have foot this bill. And the thing is that we don't seem to be having any central government funding coming down to actually help us with this and enforcement orders, you know, the fact we could look at enforcement orders to say if you did, you get a big fine. I mean, the thing is that we just, uh, we missed that link where we can't actually just prosecute without, with true success on the story. Does that make sense? Makes sense, David. Um, yeah, okay. Um, have you got any other questions or comments? No, we have nothing. That's fine, thank you. I just thought I'd, um, Councillor Ray Bryan, you wanted to respond? 
Yes, uh, and in answer to several questions, actually, uh, I've got to say I'm very heartened by the comments that are coming out so far, and it really does give us a, a guidance on uh, um, the way forward. I think the most important thing we need to get across is the message that we need help from the public on this. We can do what we can do, but we need to make sure we get the message out to the general public that they've got their part to play, and I hope that will be the outcome. Uh, of the final report. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Ray. Right, if that's everything from committee members, we move on to um, members um, who've asked to speak. First of all, we got Councillor um, Clayton. Kelvin, have you got are you there? I, I am here, Chair. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Um, this council has already agreed that we face a climate and ecological emergency. Does this committee consider that this strategy document fully acknowledges the urgency that is normally associated with an emergency? The methodology that has produced this document is expressed in its forward, and I quote, while other councils around the country may have chosen to set deadlines for carbon reduction and then work out how we'll achieve them, I've always wanted us to do the investigation information gathering first before setting out our strategy. This ensures that our action plan and timetable is both realistic and achievable, as well as ambitious, end of quote. Such caution is far from ambitious. Uh, we have never faced such an emergency before. And as we have no relevant experience, we cannot know what actions are realistic. But we do know what needs to be done. The, IPP, the IPCC, the International Panel on Climate Change, have been telling us for years. It's no longer about the science or the evidence. It's about the political implications of the science and evidence. It's about the political leadership that this council is prepared to give. This council should have by now clearly laid out what needs to be achieved across the Dorset area. It should have set the challenge and be providing the leadership for meeting that challenge. Is that, is that finished, Kelvin? That, that's what I have to say for the time being. Yeah, I think it's much as sim similar to what I mentioned in, in sort of my words at the start of this. Um, we do need that action plan. There's no doubt about that. that that's, that's essential. We do need to work at pace rather than be overly precise because I'm, I'm convinced as you are that whatever figures we come up with in the very near future will never be right um there will always things will be changing new technologies emerge uh, and whatever um i mean just just to come back very quickly chair if i may and this may not be a particularly good um analogy or metaphor um but i'm sort of reminded of our current prime minister puts winston churchill on a pedestal um, and I can't help thinking that when war was declared in 1939, that if Winston Churchill sat down and decided he would only implement what he knows realistically he can achieve, we would still be waiting there and not even close to the beaches waiting for an invasion. And of course, we work for higher authority and, and partnerships to, to help then and now. Um, uh, officers, any, op any um, responses or even Councillor Bryan? It would be wrong of me not to respond. I so thought I you would respond. Right. Thank, thank you, Chairman. <laughs> um, it's ever so easy to uh, uh, come up with the comments of uh, uh, we should have ha ha this should all have happened uh, much more quickly. And Kelvin, I really do take on board uh, your comments as I do Daryl's because I think it's very important that we've reached the stage now where we have the strategy, we're producing the action plan, costed. We can then look at what uh, uh, what we do going forward. Believe me, I am equally as frustrated as you are um, with the lack of uh, um, guidance coming down from the higher authority uh, as to what help we're going to get. We need to now uh, take on board the fact that this is going to cost a lot of money for the taxpayer. We need to work on the basis that we'll get nothing. Uh, from central government. That's not what I believe to be the case, let me tell you, but that's what we need to work on. And I will make sure um, that we keep the speed up that we've gained in the last few weeks. We're, we're still working on a pandemic, so that hasn't gone away. 
Um, but I do feel, Kelvin, that uh, um, you need to just uh, uh, bear with us in the short term. Um, there's a lot still to be done, and uh, I have every confidence in the officers for making sure that we uh, we get this. I am lobbying like mad to get some money out of central government so we can get some of these um, options uh, dealt with a lot quicker. I know that people aren't happy with the set date of 2040, but the 2040 is a date that I'm assured by officers we can achieve. Had we gone for an earlier date, I think we would have struggled to meet those dates. Mm and hopefully that answers some of your questions. Yeah, and just on that, I, I mean, I accept that the 2050 date has been brought forward to 2040, Ray, um, but it is only in terms of Dorset Council estate. It's not for Dorset Council, as a, not for the Dorset area as a whole. Um, and in terms of political leadership, I think we could be acknowledging that that needs to be in a much wider area than just Dorset Council and really providing that political leadership to get other organisations to come on board. Yeah, I think that's right, Kevin. But we will um, obviously, as as we um, set our own house in order, we will be able to influence others within within Dorset. And, and as you are fully aware, I think Dorset Council actually emits only or just slightly less than one percent of the whole Dorset emissions. So we are a tiny player as far as emissions go. But we have we are in a position to influence. There's no doubt about that. OK, we will move on then. Um, Councillor Kimber. Uh, th thank you, Chair, and um, thank you for having me this morning. Uh, very much my question is around the same as uh, Councillor Clayton's, and if I may say, first of all, may I thank the contributions from Councillor Andrew Starr and Roland Tarr as, as well. My concern is this 2050 deadline that we we have set ourselves given the global temperature rise of 1.5 my firm belief is that we are stretching it much too far and i would urge this council to work its way much more forward than 2050 i know we've said the estates can be brought down to two to uh, 2040 and i think that's something that uh, to, that we've worked on and I, I welcome that. But um, I, I would ask you to, if you like, really look at that final date. I know it's um, absolutely impossible in, in, in one sense with the finance, but I believe this is going to be, um, the uh, this debate has already started to work and look at this wider implications as other continents face devastation over this. Thank you, Jeff. I can say put that point first. If I could just come back to you on that, Paul, just to clarify, um, the 2050 date is for Dorset as yep, a whole. That's right. The 2040 date is already a target for Dorset Council. Yeah. And if you look at the um, the five yearly um, reductions in carbon emissions, I think 35 is is 90 percent, if I remember quite 30 is something like 70 percent reductions so there is a, there is a staged message there um, of reduction have you got another question or comment yeah uh, more of a comment could i uh, on the first uh, on the action plan i believe it's 07 sorry i can't get i can't open it up to give you exactly we've uh we've said one of our action plans the key, there is a key role to lobby government uh, I, I would like to also say that one of our key roles is our Dorset communities, uh, as I've said many times before, our employers to also recognise that in that um, in, in that space. We rec recognise the uh, work of our Dorset communities uh, right the way through from our action, environmental action groups, our town councils and our and, and working with our communities. So I would would, would, would ask that chair. And um, and it was like I've had an email this morning. Can we plant more trees? You know, this extends and everybody is is behind us and trying to work on this. So I recognise it's important that we we 
recognise how, how important the uh, community is. Yeah, that's my final point, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. No, I think it's extremely important that we bring everything, everybody along with us. It is part of our leadership role to make sure communities are involved. I know some of our local councils, mine here in Lyme, have got their first electric vehicle. I believe Weymouth have just got their first electric vehicle. So the message is coming down and, and, and people are moving. But yeah, we need to go right to Mrs Moggins in her house somewhere. Um, we need everybody to be involved in this. OK, thank you, Paul. Um, our last speaker is Councillor um, Jane Somper. Jane, are you there? Jane? I am, but I, points have been covered. Thank you, Daryl. Oh, thank you, Jane. That's great. That's thank excellent. you. OK, um, final question, final then request. Any Anything else from uh, committee councillors? I hear nothing then. Um, we have in front of us... Uh, Chairman, you've got, Chairman, you've got Councillor Valerie Pothokri asking to speak. Uh, I've seen that. Yeah, thank you. Val. Wow. Thank you, Chairman. I really, it's been a very interesting discussion. I think we've covered as much as we can at this stage, actually. And I would like to propose the recommendation to approve the draft Dorset Council Climate and Eco Ecological Emergency Strategy for consultation with the public following the development of a cost of delivery plan as proposed. Thank you. Thank you, Val. Um, I was going to ask for um, any other determinations? I've scribbled a few down from the committee this morning. Um, one was obviously the committee would like to see the summary for consultation um, prior to it going out. And I think virtually it's been agreed that the committee members may attend the EAP that looks at that at the time. So I think that's something we could push forward. Um, obviously, the lobbying government is, is important. I think that ought to be down as a comment. Um, partnership working and actually. Um, David's comment on planning that we should be pushing national policy changes as soon as possible. And I think that's that's the, that's the main headers I had just to add to those comments. So if you're happy um, with recommending that recommendation as written um, with those comments. Absolutely, Chairman. Uh, that's excellent. Committee members, um, we should we ought to vote on this. So we go through the list again. If you'd like to put your um, your mics on. Um, Sorry, Chairman, just to interrupt, it's Lindsay here. Yes, Lindsay. Um, we've obviously had a proposal from Councillor Pothecary. Could I just, for the purpose of the minutes, note um, if there is a second, please? Yeah, I'll I'll second was that. Sorry. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'll second that, David Taylor. There we go. Thank you, Lindsay. Um, so, myself, I will vote for Cherry. Uh, yes, agreed. Thank you. Four. Jean? Four. Simon? Four. Ryan? Four. Val, as you've Four. already agreed it. Andrew? Four. Roland? Roland, are you with Four. us? Yeah. Thank you. And David? Four. And excellent. Second it. Thank you. That, that is carried. Thank you very much. Uh, very much. That was excellent. Um, we move on now to our final item, which is the community infrastructure, uh, infrastructure levy. Um, just a couple of things. I'm, I'm, it's a couple of comments I, I'd like to make on the paper. One is the recommendation um, which asks for delegated authority for distribution of funds. I just note members should consider, do we wish member involvement in that? Um, 9.8 talks about mitigation in protected areas for planning. And I wonder if that's right, or do we want a no build policy on those same areas? And 10.5 shows the difference in neighbourhood plans. This is more of a comment. The difference actually neighbourhood plans make to the contribution paid to local authorities. Huge difference. Um, and do we want the unspent monies to be redistribu redistributed, which I think is an important factor. So we will go to um, I think it's Richard Dobson and Andrew Galpin who are presenting the papers. Are those two officers there? So we're looking for Richard Dodson and Andrew Galpin. Uh, Richard Good morning, Dodson, everyone. Uh, uh, Andrew Galpin is going to present the main. Andrew's presenting the main part of the paper. I'll, I'll just pick up any points that uh, 
if we need questions later. So Andrew's leading on this. OK, Andrew, far ahead. Thanks, Chairman, and thank you, members. Good morning, everyone. Um, so the item before you is a recommendation um, to Cabinet um, for decision next week, actually the, the Thursday, the 28th of July. Um, the paper relates to community infrastructure levy only. Um, for those that don't know, uh, SIL, as it's commonly referred to, is a developer contributions tool used by the planning service across much of the Dorset Council area. The purpose of the report is to introduce comprehensive governance arrangements to deal with the allocation and spend of monies collected through this mechanism. Bringing forward this item now as one council has avoided unnecessary abortive work. It ensures consistency in approach and recognises recent changes in planning legislation. The timing of these arrangements also coincides with the accumulation of meaningful amounts of SIL funding. SIL differs to planning obligations secured <coughs> by way of legal agreement insofar as the principle is to support the cumulative impact of development rather than any particular site specific needs. There is still a role to play for legal agreements, particularly on major sites, and recent government regulation now allow planning obligations and SIL to be used for the same item. Recent changes to government regulations have affected how we might develop these arrangements, chiefly through the removal of re re regulation requiring councils to set out in advance what their priorities are for spending SIL money. These regulations cha changes came in effect across England last September. Until that point, those predecessor councils which introduced SIL had published lists setting out their priorities for spending SIL. Priorities included flood defences, education, transport and biodiversity mitigation. This report recommends a new governance arrangement is put in place to deal with the legacy categories and commitments and identify new infrastructure challenges and priorities going forward. This, re this report recommends that those existing published priorities um, the headline infrastructure types are actually set out in Appendix C are effectively honoured up until the point at which the regulation is changed to ensure the infrastructure identified by those legacy councils can be facilitated as far as practicable. It also recommends that the charging area boundaries are retained for the purposes of, of spending that money. Infrastructure priorities will be invited to come forward annually against those categories and assessed using the scoring matrix set out in Appendix A. Thereafter, the proposed governance arrangements will help facilitate the identification and assessment of new infrastructure priorities with the charging area boundaries retained again. Paragraph 10.12 of the report before you provides further details of this process. It may be the case that many of those infrastructure priorities identified by the predecessor councils remain in place going forward, particularly where there are wide reaching cumulative impacts. The emerging impact of development on protected habitats and NHS healthcare is something which the government arrangements can also address. The report before you doesn't identify any new infrastructure costs, with the exception of the protected habitat costs identified in Appendix D. It is for the arrangements in Para 1210, uh, 10.12, sorry, which provide the vehicle for doing that. As you will see, the process involves members and officers in the governance process with key funding decisions coming before Cabinet. Um, just to give you a bit of update on, on funding and, and, and financial side of things, approximately £7 million of SIL money has been in, invoiced up to the point at which the regulation has changed in September 2019. By the end of March 2020, that had increased to £9.6 million. There will, need to be, there, will need to, there will be a need to review these governance arrangements going forward, particularly as a single charging schedule for Dorset Council is planned for development and adoption alongside the emerging local plan in 2023. This single charging schedule will include coverage of the North Dorset area. For the time being, infrastructure in the North Dorset area will continue to be secured by legal agreements. Members of this committee are asked to support the governance arrangements as set out in the report and they agree that this item is to be considered by Dorset Council Cabinet for decision. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, moving on to our committee then, um, we, we do the same again, I think. Um, Cherry, have you got any comments? Um, the only comment that I would make is that um, I think we need a, a closer definition of the term local um, for when we're applying um, or if we're looking at uh, being able to mix and match some of the um, the SIL monies um, because, you know, it, some people's perception of local is 
parish level or sub parish level and some people's is pan dorset so i think that's the only um point that i would make um and apart from that yes it makes complete sense to um to have one policy yeah. after the merging of all the councils thank okay you. thank you thank you sherry um andrew can you comment about the the definition of local or will you sure. put that yeah. into the report that goes to cabinet so the on page, uh, let me have a look. There's a map included in, in the report on page 84 of your report pack. Um, that sets out the ex existing charging areas which are operating and will, will continue to operate until a new single charging schedule is in place. So what we're proposing through the report is that money is collected within those charging areas stays within those charging areas. So you wouldn't have the situation perhaps of say, money collected through Seward Lyme Regis being spent in order halt, which is which has no bearing on that direct bearing mm. on that location. So we're trying mm. to to keep it as local as we can within the existing arrangements we've got, because, as I said, this will be replaced in time by a single charging schedule. And again, we would look at governance arrangements as, as to how that that spend is, is then broken down. I hope that answers yeah. your question. Yeah. yeah, that's fine. Thank you. It, it does still point, Andrew, but it does ask to our uh, monthly recommendation to get a delegate to the executive director of place in consultation with the portfolio holder the approval of prioritization of CIO, CIO spend. Now you're saying that's going that's going to be looked at further. So what we're proposing through para 1012 of the report is a is a is a process where we identify um, projects or we invite projects to come forward. That will go through a series of, of internal working groups um, and those recommendations will then be, be going to um, either, either cabinet where they are key decisions or perhaps some of those more minor um, funding awards or funding decisions um, could be delegated through um, the executive executive director of the place. Oh that's um, fine. In, in that's consultation. Fine. So it's not so that not every single um, bid or approach for funding has to go through cabinet. I think it, cabinet's really there for the key decisions and the, and the key challenges or tensions between um, the, between competing um, bids or competing ideas. Okay, that's much clearer. Thank you, Sherry. Anything else? No, I'm fine with that. Thank you. I think well, I, I understood the bit about the charging um, areas, but I'm, I think uh, moving forward as we when we when we actually have combined everything, that's when I'd like to make sure that that, that local is defined very well. OK, but thank you. That's it. Understood. Thank you. Um, Jean. Comments or questions? Uh, thank you, Chairman. My connection dropped for a few minutes there, so I, I've only just um, got back in, so I, I've missed a little bit of, of what was going on. But um, looking from Chickrell, it, it looks as though Chickrell will now be included in Team G, which is Weymouth and Portland as well, whereas before we were in basically what would have been Team F, which is um, basically West Dorset. That's um, just picking up on uh, Cherry's point. OK, Andrew, can you just confirm that? It seems the case. Yeah. Um, sorry, there, there's, there's no change in the areas. Those are the existing, effectively, the, the existing local authority areas from the predecessor council. So so actually Team F does include um, does include Chickrell in it. Oh, okay. um, it's probably just not very clear from that, that map. Oh. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Yeah, I've just okay. tried to highlight it a bit, but. Okay, Jean, is that all you've got? Thank you. Thank you. Um, Simon. Thank you very much, Chairman. I'm in complete agreement with all of the recommendations. It seems to strike the right balance for me between our sort of officer and governance like approach that we're trying to take. It, it's got some member engagement, and I'm happy with the accountability on it. And there was a, a small thing, and it may well be that I'm reading it wrong. Um, in Appendix A, um, page 90, um, it sets out the scoring matrix for how SIL bids would be assessed. Um, in the wider community benefits and implications sector, um, it, it asks about are there any foreseeable risks or negative impacts that may arise from the project? And it suggests that if it's no, you'll get a score of zero, but if it's yes, yeah. you'd get a score of five. Should that be the other way around? Exactly, I picked that up as well. Yeah, I think you're right. If we can go down to that um, that page. No, I think you're exactly right. So I picked up the same thing. It looks the wrong way around. 
Um, Richard, yeah. if you want to jump in here, but I, I think there probably is a, a an, an error with that with that score. And we, again, we can get that corrected for cabinet. Um, unless, thank, unless, thank unless Richard wants to drop jump in. Let go one. to it. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Richard. Yeah, yes, yeah. I think yes, I think it's a it's a um, it's, it's on your it's on your screen now. Are there any foreseeable yep. risks or negative impacts? And if it's a yes, therefore you have a risk or a negative impact. You get a higher score, which is totally the wrong way around. Yeah, it's the wrong as way. As far as, far as yeah. myself and Simon the concerned, it, it, it needs it, that needs changing. We'll change that before it goes to cabinet. Okay, that's excellent. Thank you, Thank you. Simon. Anything else? Uh, yeah, uh, just a few sort of general comments, Jeremy. I, mm -hmm. I think the principle of uh, keeping the pre and post charging schedules as you know the local areas makes a lot of sense. I agree with Cherry that when the time comes in due course to discuss what local means, I've got quite strong views on that, but that's part for today. I think this is a sensible way to merge what has been a sort of inconsistent approach to sell across the council areas and get this, gets us somewhere for now. So complete agreement and I'm happy with all of the recommendations. Happy if it's helpful, Chairman, to propose it. Thank you, Simon. Uh, Ryan. Uh, no further comments, Chair. I think it's been my comments have been pretty much uh, covered. Um, and glad to see that it's being dealt with locally, because where the development happens, that's where the infrastructure is needed to support the community. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, Val. Thank you, Chairman. I'm very happy to support um, this um, with the amendments. Um, uh, so I'll second the proposal. Thank you. Thank you, Val. Uh, Andrew. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Just one um, issue uh, again on money being spent locally. Um, in Upton, there was uh, money spent, heat and mitigation money was raised partly in Upton, but it was never spent here. But it's spent by Paul on Upton House, which is obviously a benefit to Upton, but it's not in within the, the local area, in that it's a different council altogether. I wonder, would that there's a flexibility to, to enable things like that to happen? Andrew, um, I think with with that arrangement with Heathlands that you, you've got to remember there is a, a specific policy um, underpinning Heathland mitigation or the strategy for Heathland mitigation, which is a, is a cross boundary strategy between BCP Council and Dorset Council. So there may be a little bit of flexibility in how monies are spent in that area going forward. But but you do remember that outside of this governance arrangement, there are also other policies and things guiding how how money is spent. But it's something again that we would look look at, um, and and as we develop our new charging schedule, we will look at all the costs and um, you know costs on development and how and how money is used and how infrastructure is is provided um, holistically. Um, if that that answers your question. Yes, but um, it just gives an ex um, that particular example. Just it just shows how uh, sometimes money can be spent not in your area, but it actually helps you. But yeah. so a little bit of you know, common sense is required sometimes. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, Roland? Well, my comments similar to Andrew's uh, and, and also I think Val referred to it, this, the definition of local because we've had under the old system uh, schemes which were uh, being paid for, which were so remote from the, the, I've got 13 parishes, so remote from those parishes, they have no benefit to them whatsoever. And I think that's something which we need at parish level, we need to, to ensure that um, that level of democracy is respected and they do have a say in, in how the money goes. And it, it, I'm not quite, I haven't quite got the hang of silk completely yet, but it seems to me that some decisions that are being given to deputy directors of, of departments rather than to the parish council, I may have got that wrong, but that's my comment. Okay, Roland, thank you. And David. Yeah, just reiterating what Cheryl said and Simon, uh, just great, you know, just to keep it local and the fact it must be lo locally spent because the fact is at the end of the day, it's, 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 it's another form of funding which we're losing to other areas. I just want to make sure it's specific to our area. Thank you. OK, David, thank you. Um, so, Chair, got... Chairman, can I just come back and respond on yep, a couple yep, of those certainly. points? Just um, the, 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 obviously the, the, the main thrust of the, the comments here about, about local spend, um, in the report, we do, we do set out that a, a certain proportion of all seal receipts are retained by the town or parish from where that development comes from. That's part of the, the regulations we work with. Um, that proportion is 15% where a, a town or parish doesn't have a neighbour plan. That increases to 25%. Um, and, 
um, we have been spent, we have been transferring monies from um, the, the sill income we received to those town and parishes now um, forward for a number of years. And, and they are starting to benefit from the use of that money and are reporting on it. So in terms of the balance, there is, there is a by law a, a requirement to ensure that those those town and parishes um, get a get a part of, of the still money and are, and are using it. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. And that also shows the um, the benefits of having a neighbourhood plan. Um, Councillor David Walsh, you wish to speak? Thank you, Chairman. Um, I won't take offence, but I was here today to introduce this report. Um, ah, I wish somebody uh, told me that would have been useful. <laughs> no, I don't mind. It's been fantastic listening to everything you've said and what everyone else has said. I mean, I was going to start off with nobody would like to follow the um, previous report. Of course, Draft Dorset Council Climate and Ecological Emergency Strategy for Public Consultation being hugely important. But as I see this being the community infrastructure levy, this is also hugely important. And Andrew, thankfully, has just answered one of the comments regarding neighbourhood plans, because the whole reason this was brought in by government was to um, encourage um, um, parishes and towns to bring forward development in their own areas that they yeah. wanted local development. <laughs> so with that, they can have some finance coming forward with this. And as Andrew said, neighbourhood plans that have been made get more, those that haven't get less, but they still get money. And I want um, something sort of enforced here that stakeholders, including statutory bodies and voluntary organisations, need to be aware of the availability of SIL funding, which may be available towards appropriate infrastructure provision. Because all this was brought forward with SIL to enable infrastructure. We all know how important that is. And this is very, very important. Maybe not as important as climate change, but locally, yes, it very much is. Because we all know with development, the most important thing with our residents is the supporting infrastructure. And this is to ensure there are sustainable integrated spatial plans for housing, infrastructure, employment and environment at our towns, suburbs and rural areas. This is huge. It is a small document compared to previous ones, but this in itself is a huge document and it's very, very important. And we as members need to be out there talking with our town and parish councils about how they can utilise the spend on this. This is very, very important. And I wasn't able to introduce the paper. Well, I would like to thank the officers for all the work they've done in bringing it forward. So, thank you, Chairman. <laughs> thank, thank you, David. I can I'll take just, a hint. I'm very thick-skinned. <laughs> message taken. Um, no, no, I think you're right. I mean, if we could get a good comms message out to reinforce that message you just you just read out um, to town and parish councils, and yeah. to emphasise the importance of a neighbourhood plan and the additional monies that they can receive. Are you content with that, sir? You're smiling. Thank you, David. Um, right, moving on. Um, we already have Simon proposed the recommendation as written. We have Val seconded it. So Ch there. Chairman. Yes. It's that? Lindsay. Just on a point of clarification, mm -hmm. as you just set out, the um, the recommendation as set out in the report was proposed by Councillor Gibson and seconded by Councillor Possecury. When Councillor Possecury seconded the um, recommendation, she made reference to um, the amendments as well. And I just wanted to be clear that she means the amendment that was just picked up in the report, the reference to risk and not any amendments to the recommendation as set out in the report. That's correct, Lindsay. Thank you. You're mute, Daryl. Sorry, I don't know how that happened. It's got a mind of its own. It must be David. Um, OK, uh, that's that one. Um, so we have Simon proposed, Val seconded. Um, could we just go through the list again then? Cherry? Yes, agreed. Jean? Agreed. Ryan? Agreed. Andrew? Agreed. Roland? Agreed. And David? Agreed, thank you. And that is unanimous. Thank you very much all. Right, moving on to agenda item eight. Sorry, Chairman, just Lindsay again, just again yeah. for the purpose of procedure. Um, I, I only counted six members responding at that point. Did, yeah, did because the, the, the seventh and eighth um, proposed and seconded. OK, so we're, we're taking them as well. Yeah. OK, yeah. thank you. OK, thank you. Right, place scrutiny committee forward plan. Um, you've all had a look at that. Um, it's not extremely well populated at the moment. 
because of the fact that this is our last meeting and there will be a new committee and new chair to look at um, items moving forward and to populate that table. Um, the only comment I had was the one I had previously. The, at the very end of that, um, that item, there's a list of proposals or future topics that the new chair and committee may consider. Um, we thought that ease the transition and help with, with moving forward. Uh, has anybody got any comments on that forward plan? No, I hear nothing. Um, I did look at the um, cabinet decisions of the 5th of May and the 30th of June. I saw nothing for us to consider. Has there anybody else got anything to consider on those items? No, that's great. Excellent. Thank you. Um, one one final comment on that. Um, it's about our scrutiny process within Dorset Council. I personally believe that without a full time dedicated scrutiny officer, it's been extremely difficult to move this forward. I don't know what the other committee chairs think, but I think it's something um, I'd leave with the SLT for them to consider for future scrutiny. Thank you. Chairman, it's John Sogren, Executive Director for Place. Yes, I just wonder if I might ask your uh, Vice Chairman if uh, she might be willing. I, as Director, I'd just like to uh, uh, ask members to, to thank you on, on our collective behalf in the Directorate for the support you've given us through the, the last 12 months. It's been a very interesting time for me professionally and for the whole team as we've worked to create this new council. And I do think that the role that Scrutiny has played and that you've played as chair of this Scrutiny Committee have ensured that we've got this new council off to um, the very best possible start. Um, and I, I would personally like to thank you, but I perhaps ask your vice chairman if she might seek the wider agreement of members to that uh, being recorded. Thank you, John. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Chairman. Um, if I if I may then speak to the other members of the committee. Um, obviously, we've we've all worked with Daryl. Some of us have worked with him in in previous uh, organisations, but we've worked very well as um, base scrutiny committee. And I think he's been um, unafraid sometimes to uh, to dig out some things that needed to be dug out and I, and I, I have a great deal of respect for that. So um, on behalf of the committee members, I'm assuming that they're they're all in agreement. I'd like to say thank you very much and um, good luck. <laughs> thank, you, thank you, Chair. <laughs> thank you. Thank, thank thanks you, everybody. No, we work well as a committee. I think it's, it's been really interesting and um, yeah, I shall hopefully I'll be there anyway for whoever takes on this role. Um, mm. in the new structure if, if they want anything any help always here okay final item is item item nine and this is exempt business we have no exempt business um and therefore i'd like to thank everybody everybody for their contribution and close the meeting at 11 37 thank you all very much <laughs>